Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. A um, couple of preliminary remarks from me, and then I'm going to turn it over. Uh, first, Dan Strand and I uh, want to thank everybody for coming, some of you from quite far away, some of you from warmer climes. Sorry about this, but uh, it's good for you. Um, and a special welcome to Chaplain Sean Weed, uh, and hopefully later, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Clay will be coming, and just at least on behalf of my family. I want to say thank you uh, for your good service, all you do. Uh, Chaplain Mallard, you as well. Um, we appreciate it. Um, and thank you as well to the Martin Marty Center and the Theology and Ethics Workshop for sponsoring all of this. And I also want to thank uh, the Renaissance Hotel in St. Louis for canceling the reservations of the Society for Christian Ethics, <laughs> forcing them to move here to Chicago where we could take advantage of Nigel Bigger and everyone else. So thank you. Uh, one matter of housekeeping, please be advised of a couple schedule changes, slight ones. Uh, there's two. First, in the following session, we'll begin with opening remarks from Professor Richard Miller, um, and then move into the featured presentation by Professor Bigger, and then just the one response from Chaplain Mallard. And then secondly, our afternoon session begins one half hour earlier, so at 1.30 instead of 2 p.m., um, if you need the translation for those in uniform, I believe that's 1330 hours instead of 1400 hours. Same place. Now, on to business. In his book, What It Is Like to Go to War, Marine Captain Veteran, uh, Marine Combat Veteran Carl Melantis writes the following The violence of combat assaults psyches, confuses ethics, and tests souls. This is not only a result of the violence suffered, it is also a result of the violence inflicted. Warriors suffer wounds to their bodies, to be sure, but because they are involved in killing people, they also suffer from compromises with or outright violations of the moral norms of society and religion. These compromises and violations are not generally discussed and their impact on a warrior's mental health and soul is minimized or even ignored entirely, not only by current military training, but by society at large. And while I would quibble with some of the language, I am agreed that these issues ought not to be ignored, and today they will not be ignored. Opening our session, Professor Richard Miller is Professor of Religious Ethics here at the Divinity School with interests in religion and public life, political and social ethics, and practical ethics, among others. His published works include interpretations of conflict, ethics, passivism, and the just war tradition, and terror, religion, and liberal thought. And it's a pleasure to have you here, um, both at the Divinity School and at this session. We're grateful for your willingness to open us up. Professor Nigel Bigger is Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at Christ Church, Oxford, with research interests including theories of natural law, the theology and ethics of national identity and loyalty, of forgiveness, and of killing, particularly regarding suicide, euthanasia, and war. His published works include Burying the Past, Behaving in Public, I have bought this book for my children, <laughs> Between Kin and Cosmopolis, and In Defense of War, from which much of his talk today will be drawn. And then our respondent, Chaplain Colonel Timothy Mallard has served for 26 years as in commissioned service in the United States Army Chaplaincy. He's been deployed at battalion, brigade, and division levels in Saudi Arabia in 1991, Bosnia Herzegovina in 1996. He was at the Pentagon on 9 11, 2001. He was in Afghanistan in the winter of 2002, Iraq in 2003, Iraq in 2010, through 2011. Uh, like some of us, he is a PhD candidate um, and will be completing this in 2015. He is an <laughs> Yes? Yes. Very good. <laughs> and my wife will tell you, so am I. Sorry. 
He is an Army strategist as well as an Eisenhower Fellow. So with that, the podium is yours, <coughs> Professor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thanks, Dan, for organizing this event. And uh, thanks to our two guests uh, for their visits and their thoughts today. Uh, I thought what I would do would be to uh, map the landscape of the ethics of war, um, especially just war reasoning, as a way of framing uh, today's conference and shedding light on some of the specific issues that our speakers will be addressing. As Mark's comments pointed out, uh, they'll be focusing on both the ethics and psychology of combatant, combatant killing. And that particular question, I think, is helpfully framed if we understand the broader intellectual and moral tradition uh, on which those ethical reflections and psychological, I think, implications typically rely. And so in order to do that, let's just start with the image of a funnel. And I'm going to start at the top of the funnel and as some of you know, uh, by way of a number of distinctions, I'm going to work us down toward the base of the funnel where I'm going to then locate Professor Bigger's ideas on the landscape of the ethics of combatant, combatant killing. I'll then pose a general question for us to take up at some point, perhaps, in the conference, and then I'll turn things over to our speakers. So let's start at the top of the funnel when thinking about war. In the tradition of just war reasoning, the basic idea is that war is not hell. It may be tragic, it may be awful, it may include evils, but the institution itself, the idea goes, is what is called a rule-governed activity. That is to say, there are legitimate moral expectations that surround political leaders and military officers and soldiers regarding decisions whether to enter war and how to conduct themselves in war. So war is not hell, it's a rule-governed activity with moral expectations. Now, as we move down the tunnel, what will, uh, the funnel, pardon me, we'll see is that that set of expectations break themselves out into two general clusters. One cluster is grouped under what is called the jus ad bellum. It pertains to questions of whether it is just or right to enter war. That concerns the general moral wisdom of whether or not war, going to war, is just. And typically, the use ad bellum is triggered by injustices of this sort. Human rights violations, violations of international law, or aggressions against state sovereignty. Typically, those sorts of reasons are the kind of reasons that lead us to say going to war is or can be justified. Distinct from the use ad bellum is what is called another set of moral considerations, the use in bellum. That concerns conduct in war, whether certain kinds of behaviors are acceptable or unacceptable. And typically, the use in bellow concerns how combatants are to conduct themselves in the course of war. Okay? Now, standardly in just war thinking, until rather recently, quite frankly, the focus of ethicists attending to matters of the use in bellow have focused on how combatants comport themselves in relation to non-combatants. Whenever our consciences are triggered by reports of atrocities, we're typically thinking about 
how soldiers or military officers conducted themselves against or in relation to unarmed or non-combatant individuals. Okay? Recently, and in, and in part, I think, for reasons of the sort that Mark identified, having to do with the, the, the burdens that soldiers bring home and think about subsequent to their missions in war, there's been increasing attention to combatant-combatant relationships. That is to say, how combatants engage other combatants in the course of war. And that has opened up a realm of rather interesting philosophical analysis concerning how combatants and on what basis uh, they should engage themselves as lethal threats. So as we're moving down the tunnel, we've uh, the funnel, pardon me, we've looked at these two basic pillars. Then of those two pillars, we've thought about the second, the use in bellow. And then within that cluster, two sets of relationships. Now, as we think about combatant-combatant relationships, or whether, com uh, whether and on what terms combatants have the right to pose lethal threats to each other, three, pardon me, two models have materialized in the philosophical literature. I want to identify or describe those models and then contrast them with Professor Bigger's model, just by way of, again, helping sketch the landscape. The first model is the model developed by Michael Walzer in his signature book, Just and Unjust Wars, a moral argument with historical illustrations, first published in 1977. And on Walzer's view, um, Soldiers have what he calls the equal right to kill. One of the core questions underlying that statement is the question, when is killing justified? When is killing not justified? Or when is killing murderous and when is it not? Now on Walzer's view, when soldiers kill or try to kill each other, they do not commit murder. Why? On his account, when soldiers enter, enter um, their role, they become what he calls dangerous men. We would today say dangerous men and women. And by virtue of entering that role, they forfeit the normal rights that we enjoy to life and liberty. So by virtue of becoming a threat, an authorized threat in the role of being a combatant, on Walzer's view, soldiers forfeit their rights to life and liberty. And then when they take each other's lives, they do not commit murder. Okay? Regardless of which side they are on, Walzer would argue we can distinguish between a just war or a just side and an unjust side. We can draw that distinction. But we don't draw the distinction between just and unjust warriors. Okay? That's why there's an equal right to kill on his model. That picture has recently been called into serious question by the philosopher Jeff McMahon. And Jeff McMahon um, revisits some traditional sources in just war thinking and argues that there's something counterintuitive about Walzer's picture. And he asks us very basically, how can we think of, for example, German soldiers and abstract from the justice of their behavior? On his view, we should not, as it were, detach the morality of combatant-combatant killing 
from the more basic use ad bellum question of the justice of one side or the other side. So on McMahon's view, we should think of soldiering as like police work. In a lethal situation between a criminal and a policeman, we wouldn't ever say they were moral equals. We would say one is justified in posing a threat to the other. Only one of the two has forfeited something basic about life or liberty. And so on McMahon's view, there isn't an equal right to kill. When soldiers are in combat, one has the right to kill and the other doesn't. One has the right, the other's killing is murder. Okay? Now, what Walzer and McMahon both have in common are two points. One is the language and the importance of forfeiture. On Walzer's view, soldiers on both sides forfeit their right to life and liberty. Call that a threat-based theory of forfeiture. It's by virtue of being a threat to each other. On McMahon's view, forfeiture is also important. But his is not a threat-based view. It's a justice-based view. And you forfeit your right to life and liberty if you are a soldier on an unjust side. Now, as McMahon develops his theory, there are all kinds of qualifications that enable him to make greater practical sense of that point. But that's the core distinction. Okay? Both rely on forfeiture. They justify or they think about the reasons for forfeiting in different ways. The second point they have in common okay, is that those who um, are, have forfeited okay, may be intentionally killed. Okay? Those who have forfeited their right to life and liberty may be intentionally killed. That is to say, if they're killed, murder has not occurred. Now, on this landscape, I don't want to say enter Professor Bigger, but let's locate Professor Bigger. Okay, his view is different as I understand it, and I welcome friendly correction. <laughs> um, his view uh, is different from their views in two ways. One, it prescends entirely from the language of forfeiture. Okay? There's nothing about either being a threat or being an unjust warrior okay, that informs his view of the ethics of combatant, non-combatant killing. Exhibit A, that's one difference. Okay? The language of forfeiture doesn't shape his views. What does shape his views is the language of love. And on his account, which we'll hear him explain more thoroughly this morning. On his view, um, the requirement of love should discipline the conduct of combatants in war, and I think it's fair, regardless of the side they're on. Okay? So there is a discipline that must shape the way in which combatants engage each other. In that respect, Professor's Bigger, mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. Bigger's views stand squarely within the use in bellum, bellum of the just war tradition. There are limits on what a soldier can do. His views dig deep into the moral psychology okay, of soldiering. That's exhibit A. Uh, exhibit B is that on Bigger's view, soldiers may not intentionally kill each other. They may engage each other in ways that are lethally dangerous, but intentionally to kill, on his account, is unwarranted. Again, on views that are tied to his understanding of the requirements of love. Right, so. Now, with that landscape in place, let me just pose a question having to do with 
Mark's opening remarks regarding uh, what is called moral injury. And just to repeat uh, the, the core idea, moral injury isn't a, a, a concept having to do with an injury that a soldier might do to another soldier or to a non-combatant, okay? It's the injury that, uh, as it were, attends to or attaches to the carrying out of one's duty, which will, would include the taking of others' lives. And the injury, as the moral injury of soldiers has uh, uh, informed us, isn't simply about being caught in dilemmas or being forced to make decisions or carrying out behavior that are against one's conscience, moral injury can also attach to the soldier's performance on the best description of soldiering. Now, my question is, to, at least to me and perhaps to you all and to our participants, is do any of these three models look better or worse to us in light of concerns about moral injury? How can we, can we test them, not on their philosophical merits, not on their theological merits, but on their psychological merits? Are there ways that a, the bigger model or the McMahon model or the Walzer model stands up better when we think about both having to train soldiers and uh, heal soldiers upon their return from battle. So how do we think about the models in light of that moral psychological test? That is a comment or a thought I'd just like to share apropos of this morning's conference themes. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Let me turn things over to our friend and visitor, Professor <coughs> Nigel Baker. Thank you very much, Professor Miller, for that uh, lucid setting of the scene uh, in the course of which I came to understand myself better. Pardon me? I came to understand myself better. Uh, is this working? It's not. My, uh, since I've got a soft voice. Is it working? Is it working? Okay, fine. Uh, I, I seem to have a perennial cold, so, so my voice is always rather soft. Um, so thank you for that, um, and uh, thank you very much to Mark and Dan for inviting me to be part of this discussion, which I uh, am looking forward to immensely. Uh, it is fun being back in Swift Hall. I, I was here with Professor Miller as a graduate student more decades ago than I care to state. Um, so it's really fun to, to be back here with you. Um, you have a handout, I hope. Uh, on which you find uh, the list and order of topics I will address uh, and uh, references for the many quotations I will make. Um, most of the references refer to my own book. Uh, that wasn't simply a subtle way of getting you to go and buy the book if you want to... Uh, uh, dig out the reference again. Uh, I didn't have time to hunt down all the individual references, uh, but in those cases where I make a quotation that doesn't appear in the book, I have uh, taken the trouble to identify the source. Um, I haven't uh, timed what I'm going to say very carefully, uh, but I promise I won't speak for more than 35 minutes as I was asked not to. Uh, so I may have to um, cut some of what I plan to say as I go along. Uh, we'll just have to find out uh, once I start. I've already decided to cut some of the material just so that we can finish on time and there'll be plenty of time for uh, open discussion. So I approach um, the issue of justice in war as a Christian moral theologian. Uh, therefore, uh, I feel bound to articulate uh, just war in terms of uh, an overarching norm of love. And I'm aware that, that um, 
there are a variety of approaches to just war, and uh, those who are not uh, Christian moral theologians um, will not necessarily be burdened with this business of love. Uh, it, it does present, as we will see, certain problems. Uh, uh, whether it also uh, provides certain advantages, we might want to discuss. But I'm aware that, that non-Christian approaches to just war uh, won't necessarily feel bound to think in terms of love. But why do Christians feel bound? Well, of course, uh, it's because of um, Jesus' summary of the moral law uh, in two basic terms, love God, love your neighbor. Um, and especially, love your enemy neighbor. Uh, in negotiating uh, the way from the New Testament to just war doctrine, um, St. Augustine made a crucial move. Uh, in interpreting the Pauline the injunction of St. Paul not to, to return evil for evil. Augustine shifted the focus away from the damage caused to the object of force to the motive of the agent of force. Away from harmful consequences to the agent's heart. And of course, there's plenty of dominical precedent for this focus on the, on the inward, on the heart. Uh, so, uh, in his letter to the tribune Flavius Marcellinus in 411, 412 AD, he writes, For what is it, what does it mean not to return evil for evil? Romans 12, 17. Except to shrink from a passion for revenge. That's how he interprets it. For people are often helped to be helped against their will by being punished with a sort of kind harshness. If the earthly commonwealth observes Christian precepts in this way, then even wars will be waged in a spirit of benevolence. So when the phrase just war spirituality is used, that's what I understand it to be referring to, the spirit of benevolence or the spirit of love. So the articulation of just war thinking in terms of a spiritual or moral disposition is certainly, it seems to me, characteristic of Christian thinking. How distinctive it is, well, it depends on what you compare Christianity with. Um, I know little about Islamic and Confucian uh, just war thinking. Uh, I don't know enough to know whether they feel bound to articulate just war in terms of some overarching disposi dispositional norm. Uh, I do know enough about contemporary moral philosophy to know uh, that, uh, for example, David Roden's understanding of just war, which he takes from Michael Walzer, operates in terms of rights, primarily. Uh, David uh, mentions uh, the, the doctrine of double effect with its focus on intention in a footnote and passes it over entirely. Um, so, so there's certainly... Um, um, and it, from what, I mean, I have read Jeff McMahon, but pr from what Professor Miller recounts, uh, it, it seems, I think, that McMahon operates primarily in terms, terms of, of rights. Um, and I'm aware that this focus on love, this approach to the issue of just war in terms of love and intention, uh, is different from an approach primarily in terms of rights. Um, an approach that focuses on, on the dignity of the object of force and the rights that generates and the, uh, the correlative obligations. Uh, th there's a difference here. 
at this point, I don't quite understand it. Um, ask me in 12 months' time. Or maybe ask me in two hours' time. Uh, what is clear is that the, di the difference is not absolute. So, you know, if you, if you talk in terms of love, you can't talk very long before you have to talk in terms of the good of the beloved. Because what is it to love except to serve the good of the beloved? And you might then talk, talk in terms of dignity. And you might actually talk in terms of rights, eventually. Correlatively, if you talk in terms of, of rights, the, the rights of the, of the potential object of, of uh, a lethal act, uh, then eventually you will talk in terms of the duty of respect on the part of the one who might harm you. So, so both conceptualities have subjective and objective poles, so they're not absolutely different, but, but they are somewhat different. Quite how they're different, I'm not sure yet. Okay, uh, section two. Is a Christian spirituality of just war psychologically plausible? So here, here's, here's the problem. Uh, a Christian, I think, is bound to, to approach uh, just war matters in terms of love, but is it really plausible in combat to talk about soldiers loving? So here, here's, that's the problem. Here's my attempt at an answer. Well, I think it is plausible uh, to talk in terms of soldiers in combat being motivated by love for their comrades. Yeah? But this is the easy bit, of course. But, th but this is important. Um, Jesus did enjoin us to love our enemies, but that wasn't the only kind of love he enjoined us uh, to practice. He also said, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Excuse me, for the sexist version of the New Testament, but you've heard the saying before, right? So there is, there is a confirmation here of love for friends as well as enemies. Don't just love your enemies. Is this plausible? Well, um, to some extent it has to do with a matter of language. Um, so uh, in a few months' time they will be published an article by General Sir Hugh Beach. Hugh um, uh, was a, a very senior uh, officer in the British Army. Uh, he is also old enough to have fought in Normandy, where he was shot in the spine, but survived to become a very sprightly 90-year-old. Um, now, uh, 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 and Hugh is a Christian, uh, but Hugh says, uh, I never came across the word love as applied to my comrades in arms, let alone the enemy. Brackets, I think it would have been met with a snigger. So Hugh, as a Christian, is not entirely convinced that talking in terms of love is easily applicable to combat soldiers. But of course, Hugh does belong to my parents' generation. And this, this matters a bit, I think. Um, on the other hand, you've got uh, Lieutenant Patrick Berry, uh, an officer in the Royal Irish Regiment, which, in spite of its title, is a British regiment, not an Irish one, who fought in Helmand uh, um, in 2008, I think. And in his... Uh, uh, of all the books on Afghanistan and Iraq that I've read, and I've not read them all, uh, um, I think Berry's is the most thoughtful. Uh, call sign Hades, it's called. And uh, in, in uh, part of his book, he writes... There's a section where he, says, he writes the following. Uh, he is addressing one of his uh, NCOs. Corporal McCord, I'm sorry for shouting at you in front of... He interrupts me and speaks hurriedly, passionately. I love you, boss. I do anything for you. I take a bullet for you. He looks at me. It's not often that a man tells another he loves him, especially in front of other men. I think of the effort I have made to respect and protect the boys, to build the team, to earn their trust and respect. And we call it respect because it's easy to say. It's not soft and it's not embarrassing. But Matt has called it by its true name, love. Simple platonic love. 
this love that motivates man to do the most touching, brave, selfless things for their brothers. A love so deep it burns and tingles in you when it flickers, reminding you that there are things greater than you, more important than you, things that last longer than you, and sometimes out here you get a glimpse and you understand. You understand why soldiers charge machine guns or hold out to the death while others escape. Love. For love melts fear like butter on a furnace. It transcends it. You can call it by different names, but I think Berry is right. And uh, a generation um, less allergic to sentimentality than, than Hugh Beecher's might call it by that name. But my military colleagues can tell me whether soldiers are accustomed to naming it as such. But in a sense, the name doesn't matter. It's the thing that matters. But the, the really tough question for Christian ethicists is love for the enemy. Combat soldiers, can they love the enemy plausibly? Well, everything depends on what you mean by love. Let, let's, let, let's, let's move away from, so, from uh, fuzzy sentimentality and, and take, take, take a minimal understanding of love for the enemy as a lack of hatred. Or less minimally, the possibility of fellow feeling or compassion. Lack of hatred, I think, uh, is um, quite plausible. I don't think that combat soldiers necessarily hate the enemy. Uh, for example, uh, Richard Tawney, uh, famous, who, who survived first, the First World War to become a famous Anglican economic historian, uh, fought in the Manchester Regiment at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, on, on the first day of which, you may remember, uh, the British suffered 60,000 casualties and 20,000 dead, day one. He was among the wounded, shot, lay in no man's land for 36 hours. Was fortunately picked up, um, taken back to Britain, convalesced in Oxford, and then wrote an article which was published. And in this article, he complained about the hatred he found among civilians. And he wrote... Uh, and uh, the word Tommy here refers to a British soldier. And this Tommy is a creature at once ridiculous and disgusting. He's represented in your newspapers as finding sport in killing other men, as hunting Germans out of dugouts as a terrier hunts rats, as overwhelming with kindness the captors, captives of his bow and arrow. The last detail is true to life, but the emphasis which you lay upon it is both unintelligent and insulting. Do you civilians expect us soldiers to hurt them or starve them? Don't you see we regard these men who've sat opposite us in mud, square-headed bastards as we called them, uh, as the victims of the same catastrophe as ourselves, as our comrades in misery much more truly than you are, do you think that we're like some of you in accumulating on the head of every wretched antagonist the indignation felt for the wickedness of a government, of a social system, or if you will, of a nation? Hatred of the enemy is not common, I think, among those who have encountered him. It is, it is incompatible with the proper discharge of our duty, for to kill in hatred is murder, and soldiers, whatever their nationality, are not murderers, but executioners. I think he's wrong on that last point, but we'll come back to that. Uh, or I could quote from another war, George Orwell, uh, fought for six months uh, for the Republicans in the, civil, in the Spanish Civil War, um, who writes, uh, of his, he, he was shot in the throat and uh, um, carted off back to England. Uh, he wrote, uh, a year and a half later, quote, one of the most horrible features of war is that all the screaming and lies and hatred comes invariably from people who aren't fighting. Okay, so that, that's my point. I don't think hatred is necessarily um, part of a combat soldier's uh, armory of emotions. Um, but, but Orwell also suggests that a measure of fellow feeling is possible. <coughs> so he comments on the sniper who shot him. And he says... 
I could not feel any resentment against him. I reflected that as he was a fascist, I would have killed him if I could. But that if he had take, been taken prisoner and been brought before me at this moment, I would merely have congratulated him on his good shooting. And then finally, uh, so we've got the non-necessity of hatred. We've got perhaps a measure of fellow feeling between combatants. Finally, uh, compassion perhaps uh, as, a more, as a more positive emotion. Uh, Chris Keeble, um, during the Falklands War in 1982, uh, was a major in the parachute regiment. Um, his commanding officer was killed. He took command. Uh, the British were attacking uh, Argentinians. The parachute regiment um, has a reputation for being the hardest, uh, which is why it was insane to put them on the streets of Belfast in 1971. Um, the British prevailed, uh, and after uh, I asked Chris, I said, is it, is it at all plausible to talk of combat soldiers loving the enemy? And he thought, he said, yeah. No, actually, I asked him, is it plausible for them to have compassion for the enemy? He said, well, not during battle, but afterwards he said, I remember seeing these hardened paratroops cradling wounded Argentinians in their arms. Now, <laughs> if you asked a paratroop, was he loving the enemy, he would have sniggered. But he was. Next point. Um, Mark, I'm losing all track of time here, so you, uh, when, you, when I should speak within, when I should stop speaking uh, within ten minutes, let me... Okay, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, a question I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer this, and, and again, those are with military experience need to tell me. Um, the, the question is, is whether soldiers have to be trained to dehumanize the enemy in order to kill him. And uh, Martin Cook, um, who was, as it happens, also a student here when Professor Miller and I were students, uh, Martin Cook, um, in his article, Is Just War Spirituality Possible?, uh, quotes... Uh, J. Glenn Gray's uh, remarkable book, uh, that, uh, Gray's reflections on, on World War II uh, and Berry's reflections on Afghanistan are, are the two best books I've read on um, combat soldiers' experience. Um, but Martin uh, quotes Gray as saying, and I've forgotten this, that most soldiers are able to kill more easily in warfare if they possess an image of the enemy sufficiently evil to inspire hatred and repugnance. Now, if that's true, that's a problem for a Christian ethicist. <laughs> um, I do remember seeing a documentary on uh, um, the training of British Army officers at Sandhurst, where there is a, a scene where they're being trained to bayonet and they're being required to work themselves into a frenzy, screaming. Um, I don't know quite what to make of that, but I, I, I interrogated a bit. I, I'm not sure frenzy necessarily means hatred. It can also mean terror on the part of the soldier. Uh, or at least working up steam to overcome Tremendous fear. <laughs> um, but anyway, it seems to me, given what I said earlier on about, about the non-necessity of hatred, it's not clear to me that one has to hate the enemy to shoot them. But those with experience of military training need to inform us about that. Next question is, is um, whether we can make a distinction between dehumanization and, de uh, and demonization. And I, wa I want to float this one. I, wa I want to argue de a certain kind of dehumanization is okay. Demonization is not. And this relates to um, what I try to argue in my book as, as um, being the virtue of callousness. By which I really mean clinical detachment from human suffering. 
Um, it seems to me clear that military commanders, if they want to succeed, um, have to be able to detach themselves from the consequences on their own people of what they're asking them to do. So take uh, General Douglas Haig, 1914 to 18, uh, who was responsible for the Battle of the Somme. According to Winston Churchill, quote, Haig presents to me in those red years the same mental picture as, the, as a great surgeon before the days of anesthetics, before the days of anesthetics. Intent upon the operation, entirely removed in his professional capacity from the agony of the patient. He would operate without excitement, and if the patient died, he would not reproach himself. But then Churchill adds, it must be understood that I speak only of his professional actions. Once out of the theater, his heart was as warm as any man's. And actually, Haig visited field hospitals in the days immediately after the first battle of the Somme, and was after that uh, urged by his staff to cease doing so because it, it upset him so much. But to do the job, you can't afford to be upset. Uh, then another example, uh, um, Battle of El Alamein, North Africa, 1942. <laughs> um, General Freyberg uh, calls General Lees to a meeting to communicate uh, General Montgomery's instructions. Excuse me, uh, not, not General Lee, General Curry. And according to uh, a description, quote, when Curry's time came to make comment on the instructions he'd received, he rather diffidently suggested that by the end of the day his brigade might well have suffered 50% casualties. To this, Freyberg had replied with studied nonchalance, perhaps more than that, the armor commander, army commander Montgomery says, that he's prepared to accept 100%. Uh, you have to detach yourself from the consequences of what you're ordering if you're going to be a successful military commander. And incidentally, M Montgomery was loved by his troops uh, because they trusted that he wouldn't waste them, though they knew he would spend them. Okay. Uh, and... Um, Take this one step further. This, 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 so far, it has to do with, with, with this clinical detachment of the commander from um, the damage that his actions will cause his own people. What about the damage to the enemy? Well, well again, I, my sense here is that professional soldiers uh, uh, adopt a kind of clinical detachment. Um, I, I, first, I was first clued into this when I um, talked to a, a, a student in my college in Oxford who uh, was a, a university boxer. He used to come to, occasionally to, to chapel before he had a big fight. And Alex was a Hindu, so this was slightly odd. Um, um, and I, I asked him, what's this about, Alex? Uh, um, uh, you know, given given the, the explosive violence of boxing... What's, what, what are you coming here for? And he said, but you, but you misunderstand. You misunderstand. To be a good boxer, you can't afford emotion. You, 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 you can't afford anger. You've got, to, you've got to be clinical and controlled. And it strikes me that professional soldiers in battle can't afford anger toward the enemy. They have a job to do. They've been trained to do it, and they do it. Um, so... It, what I'm saying here is there's a, there's a certain kind of what you might call dehumanization, which is not demonization. It's a, it's, a, it's a detachment from the suffering you're about to cause, which doesn't necessarily make you inhuman. Okay, uh, um, topic four, the springs of hatred and the possibility of discipline. So, so what I want to acknowledge here is it's, it's not as if soldiers don't sometimes feel rage. Um, and it's not as if rage isn't dangerous, but I think it can be disciplined. Uh, just to save time here, uh, I'll, I'll go to my, my last quotation because it's the most important, really. Uh, just, just to say, uh, sometimes uh, it seems to me soldiers are, are provoked to rage, more often than not, 
professional soldiers, regular soldiers, when the enemy plays dirty, when they cheat. Uh, and this will often happen when professional soldiers are fighting irregulars who aren't disciplined, who don't suffer the same constraints. There's a sense of unfairness here that it really enrages soldiers. Um, and it seems to me, uh, when the enemy plays dirty, mutil mutilates the dead, or is, is, un is unnecessarily cruel, that a certain rage is entirely appropriate. Entirely appropriate. I, that m m might seem odd for a Christian to say, uh, but I, I, I call in my defense the 18th century philosopher Joseph Butler, who developed a notion of, of, of appropriate resentment and cites St. Paul, Ephesians 4.26, be angry, but don't sin. Be angry, but don't sin. Uh, I want to read you uh, what I think is a, a really remarkable passage from Patrick Berry's uh, uh, account of his experience in Afghanistan, uh, which is an instance of rage. And forgive me, I, I'm not going to expurgate the text of the profanities, because I think profanities are necessary to express the emotion. So the scene is uh, a Talib has blown himself up laying uh, an, um, an IED laying a roadside bomb. And uh, Berry uh, comments, and I guess he's trying to capture his emotions at the time. I was glad he was dead. It was funny. He had tried to blow us up, and the stupid fucker had blown himself up. That was gratifying, warming, pleasant. But later I see the photos of his body, and I feel sick. Somewhere within me, under the hardening crust, compassion still pervades my thoughts. What about his mother, his family? What a waste of a life. My compassion lasts less than 24 hours. As we debate whether to return his body to a mosque before sundown, like the soft, moral, Geneva-bound men we are, the Taliban prepare to ambush us at the mosque. Luckily, we don't have the manpower. The family can collect them later. Then we find out about the ambush. Rage. Fuck them, the dirty, despicable bastards. Is nothing sacred? Ambush your enemy as he returns your dead? Honor, you bastards. You fucking bastards. I will kill every last one of you. I'm struggling with this war, struggling with our enemy. An enemy that says it's strictly Islamic, yet runs harems and makes and takes drugs. An enemy that uses handicapped kids as mules for suicide bombs, that executes children for going to school. I start to hate them, hate them for what they're doing to me, hate them and their terrifying suicide bombs that separate us from the locals, hate them for eroding me. Do they hate us in the same way? Yes. And I hate the locals for not standing up to them, for harboring them, sheltering them, for not returning our smiles, for not being human, for hating us, for watching us walk over IEDs. Not all of them. Not all of them. Listen to the conscience there. The rage, but the conscience. The rage, but the conscience. It is possible to control, to have conscious discipline rage. And I, I can't quote the whole thing, it's, it's on your handouts. Um, um, after coming back from Afghanistan, Buhr wrote a paper in, in which the, the essence is basically he found himself sustained by his training and uh, 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 disciplined by his training as an officer. Uh, and, uh, and his, his um, responsibility to maintain the morality of his troops. But it, it, was, it was tested and corroded. Okay, uh, point five, uh, must a combat soldier aim to kill? And this, this comes uh, back to the points that uh, Professor Miller raised at the beginning. Um, my answer so far is no, uh, but I'm perfectly aware that I, I risk sounding silly uh, because it's counterintuitive. And what's worse, it's even against Aquinas. <laughs> Because uh, uh, um, Aquinas 
gives me an out. He says that uh, it's, it's, uh, if you're a private person, you can't intend to kill, but if you're a public person, you may intend to kill so long as you aim at the public good. Why is that not good enough for me? Well, it just feels untidy, having two different rationales. Um, but also, uh, um, I guess I, I'm stuck on the notion um, that um, one should not intend someone's death in the sense of wanting it. Now, every, when we talk about intention, everything depends on what you mean by the term. And it's often a mixture of choosing and wanting. Uh, but it seems to me one shouldn't want anyone's death, although one may accept it. And one may cause it, but not want it. However, um, in a, um, a, a, an engagement with um, my, my chapter on love, uh, Tom Simpson, who's uh, now a <coughs> philosophy lecturer in Oxford, but served as five years, for five years as a, an officer in the Royal Marines and has combat experience. Uh, he um, doesn't like this, and he wants to, to say that we should think of soldiers as executioners, as Tawny suggested we should. Um, and, and, it, and of course, uh, 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 upon that point being raised, I realize that I need to revise my account because clearly an executioner has to regard the death of the convict as is his purpose. And I don't always regard uh, capital punishment as, as wrong. It depends on circumstances. So I have to admit there's at least some kind of, of killing where the, the, the death of the, the victim is, is intended. So I have to concede that. But I still don't want to say that's what soldiers are about. Uh, why not? Well... Uh, back to Patrick Bury, uh, another part of his book. Uh, they're in a firefight with the Taliban. Uh, one of his squaddies, one of his private soldiers, uh, tells them that there's a little boy over there where the Taliban are who keeps popping his head over the wall, and he's probably scouting for the Taliban. Uh, uh, Bury very, uh, takes his, uh, his comrade's rifle um, points it at the wall, waits for the head to come up, and then shoots just to the, to the right of the head as a warning. He then hands back the rifle to the, the soldier and says, next time he does that, kill him. Now, ah, did he really mean kill him? Did he tell the soldier, intend to kill? Uh, I want to say no. I want to say uh, that if, after the firefight, um, they had come across the body of the child and discovered the child was still living, they would not have shot him. In other words, the, the fact the child was disabled from scouting was sufficient. Uh, oftentimes, in combat, disabling the enemy and killing will be the same thing, but it's important for a soldier to know that disabling is the point, not the killing. Uh, I had Patrick Berry read my chapter. I'd say to stop the enemy. Sorry? I would say to stop the enemy. Stop the Okay, fine. Not necessarily to say, I mean, yeah. you may have to do those things, okay. but if an enemy surrenders, we don't kill them. Of course. Okay, good. Uh, if the enemy stops fighting. Stop. As a matter of fact, Sun Tzu says that the, the best way of fighting is to win without fighting. So killing is not the point. No, it's to stop the Good. Thank you. Just like a police officer. Yeah. Okay. That's my case. <laughs> um, otherwise, you get the situation uh, of the Royal Marine convicted last year of murder uh, because he, coming across a wounded Taliban, shot him dead. Unfortunately for him, he didn't realize that his actions were scored on, on a uh, head camera, uh, comrades. Okay. Finally, uh, getting uh, right back to uh, the issue of moral injury, or what I call the phenomenon of a troubled military conscience. Um, truth is, I, I haven't thought about this much. Uh, we need to discuss it. I intend to learn about it. Um, um, uh, 
on, on one hand, I find myself when talking to Lutherans, for, for, for whom um, uh, nothing one does is ever free of sin. Um, I find myself becoming a kind of uh, Catholic in, in wanting, wanting casuistical clarity here. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so my view is, it, it's not wrong, nothing to, there's nothing to be guilty for. If you, if, you, if, if you shot him in good faith, you're the just warrior, he's the unjust warrior, um, um, you didn't shoot him disproportionately, nothing to do, you know, false guilt, okay? But, so, uh, and there may be certain partial cases where there is a bit of false guilt, but one simply has to clarify. Um, but of course, uh, um, life is more complicated than that. Uh, um, and even if one kills someone rightly, one should probably still regret it. And there may be deep regret, which is not the same as guilt. But it has to be dealt with pastorally. Uh, and then, of course, in any you know, long period of, of military action, there may well be things that an individual not only has to regret, but to repent from. Uh, um, Life is messy. All of us uh, uh, act wrongly at some point, um, and uh, uh, combat is more stressful than most human situations. So it wouldn't be surprising if soldiers uh, um, make wrong moves, for which they need to repent. Uh, so I, I recognise the need for, for as it were, uh, uh, counselling that clarifies, also for confession, and the need for liturgies of penance and forgiveness, but also liturgies for the, the lament of the tragedy of it all. Yeah? So liturgies can do different things, and not, not simply absolve you of your sins, but also um, draw alongside you in lamenting the tragedy of it all. I mean, would that it didn't have to happen. Okay. Um, and uh, Carl Melanti has some interesting things to say about the need for more of this kind of thing at the end of his, his book, uh, which um, Mark uh, wrote to earlier. Okay, that, I'm, I fear I've gone over time, but uh, um, that's all I have to say. So I'll hand over to uh, the uh, yeah. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.